And now let's meet the host of the new Price is Right. Hi, I'm Bob Barker. Bob Barker! Bob Barker! Mr. Bob Barker. Bob Barker. Bob Barker. Oh, thank you. Well, I got my first job in radio as a result of having been an aviator in the United States Navy during World War II. I got out of the service, I came back to college, and I wanted a job. And I heard about the manager of a radio station who was crazy about airplanes. Now, I had never even been in a radio station, but I thought that might be a fun place to work. So I put on my naval officer's uniform and my wings of gold, and I went in and talked with the manager of the station, G. Pearson Ward, about airplanes for about half hour, 45 minutes, and I had my first job in radio. Ralph Edwards is probably the most important single individual in, uh, in my professional life. I had been doing audience participation shows about 10 years before I met Ralph. I had, I had come to California in 1950 and I was doing audience participation radio shows and my wife produced them and I hosted them and we did them all over. And uh, Ralph had sold Truth or Consequences as a daytime show on NBC. And he was auditioning hosts out here and he was auditioning hosts in New York, but he hadn't found just the one he wanted. And fortunately for me, he was driving one day and he turned on his car radio and he heard me doing my radio show. And he liked the way I worked. When I came back to the office, she said, Ralph Edwards called. I said, Ralph Edwards from radio and television? I couldn't believe Ralph Edwards would be calling me. She said, that's the man. <laughs> On December 21st, 1956, at five minutes past 12 noon, Ralph called me and said, Bob, you're my man. You're going to host Truth or Consequences. My first national show, and it changed everything for me. All of the good things that have happened to me later began with Ralph Edwards. And later I found out there were 11 people in the final meeting, and I got one vote. But I got the right one, <laughs> Ralph Edwards. And he convinced the other 10 to give me a chance. And I got my chance. They signed me to a contract with a four-week out clause. Either I did it or I didn't in those four weeks. And it worked out uh, that they liked my work and I did the show for him for 18 years. But after that, Ralph and I would meet every December 21st for lunch. And at five minutes past 12, we'd drink a little toast to our long and enduring friendship. Truth or Consequences was the first national show that I ever did, and uh, it was a it was a it was a perfect show for me. My experience had been doing ad lib shows always, working with unrehearsed contestants always, uh, never pre-selected contestants. I would work with contestants out of an audience on all the radio shows that I did. And when I got to Truth or Consequences, I was doing exactly the same thing. I felt completely at home from the very beginning because of the nature of the show and because of Ralph Edwards. Johnny Olson was our original announcer, and Johnny Olson was a true legend of radio and television. He worked all over the United States. He worked uh, for various people uh, and eventually became the man, so far as announcers were concerned, with Mark Goodson Productions, or with the old Goodson Todman Productions. And uh, when I first started Price is Right, I had Johnny as the announcer on the show, and I don't know how many different people said, man, you're lucky, you have Johnny. Every show wants Johnny. Well, I was with him for about 15 minutes before I, I knew why. Johnny had this great voice, and he could read 
I, he would go days without fluffing. I know that when I would hear him fluff, I'd be startled. I just, it, I, I, it would surprise me so that Johnny had fluffed. He was a delight to work with. He was a professional right down the line. He, he was a, a joy. One of my favorite people I've ever worked with. For one thing, I was a great Steve Allen fan. Uh, I can still remember one time he was uh, uh, a guest on Truth or Consequences, one of my early guests. And he came on and I said, Steve, I want to welcome you to Truth or Consequences. He said, well, Bob, you go right ahead and welcome me to Truth or Consequences. That's typical Steve Allen, you know. He was a funny, funny guy. And so I was delighted to be on uh, I've Got a Secret and be, be on anything that he did. And uh, as I recall, I auctioned off, they had taken personal things from the members of the panel, and I auctioned these things off. And uh, it was fun. We had a lot of fun. Mark Goodson, I, I never spent a lot of time with him socially. I did some. However, I, uh, I got to know him. He would come over occasionally, very occasionally, sit down in the dressing room with, with me and just the two of us talk. And I, I called him, once I became executive producer of the show, I called him frequently. What kind of fellow was he? Uh, first of all, he was uh, a man, he was a complex individual, a man of many interests and very bright, very well read, and uh, a perfectionist. He wanted everything right, and he wanted to keep it right, and as long as the show was on, he wanted it right, and as I say, he would drop in, and he'd get up to the booth and look it over, and maybe he'd have suggestions, and, and he wanted them carried out. He, he was demanding but uh, he, was, he was right, he was brilliant. When uh, the late Mark Goodson uh, told me that he would like to have me host the show, I said uh, I would definitely be interested in doing the show. And he said, well, Bob, we've changed it a lot since Bill used to do it. Bill Cullen did it originally for eight years, and then was off for eight years. And he said, I'd like to have you uh, see what we have in mind. So we met, and he told me about uh, the, taking the contestants out of the audience to come on down and, and the contestants row and then coming up on stage to play pricing games. And I was really very well impressed with it. And uh, he said, what do you think? I said, I like it. I said, he said, uh, I do too. He said, I think it'll work. He said, I think we'll get a pretty good run out of this. But he wasn't thinking of 32 years, nor was I because who could have predicted this? You know, it's never happened before. I'm often asked, why is, why is Price is Right such a long-running show? Why has it outlasted every show, uh, every game show? And, of course, my agent says it's the host. <laughs> but in all honesty, I must confess that I think it's a combination of things. First of all, uh, people get the idea that game shows are easy to come up with. You know, you walk down the street and about every other guy has an idea for a game show in his pocket and he wants to, to sell you this. It's not that easy. It has to have a, a strong, basic premise. And Price is Right has as powerful a basic premise as any show I can remember. Everything we do is based on prices, and everyone identifies with prices. Dorothy Jo uh, was my wife, and uh, she was uh, the love of my life. And she and I met when we were 15 years old in high school. We had our first date, November 17th, 1939, we went to the Shrine Mosque in Springfield, Missouri to hear Ella Fitzgerald. Ella Fitzgerald was just a girl then. She had just left the old Chick Webb band and uh, she had a hit, uh, uh, Tisca to Tasca. And I was in love. And Dorothy Joe went home and told her mother 
that we were going to, she was, I was going to be her husband, which came as a shock to her mother <laughs> because <laughs> I was a young man with no money and no prospects. But uh, we fell in love and uh, we went through the rest of high school together. We went to college for two years, then I went into the Navy. And uh, I was a naval aviator. When I got my wings, we got married. And uh, we were uh, together, worked together, and were together until the last day of her life. I've always loved animals, and uh, since I was a little boy. I lived, I, I grew up in a little town called Mission, South Dakota, out on the Rosebud Indian Reservation, 200 people. And my mother and I lived in the hotel, which was the two-story building and the tallest building in Mission. And when she was looking for me, she would go up, there was a, a, a stairway up onto the roof, she'd go up on the roof of the hotel, and she'd look off around Mission, and you could see the whole town from up there, and look for the dogs. Because I always had a pack of dogs with me. <laughs> and that's how she kept track of me. I, I wrote local news and I did a sports cast and then I I had the opportunity to become a, a staff announcer and I did various kinds of shows but I got my first chance to do what was called in those days audience participation which is exactly what I do now working with unrehearsed contestants out of a studio audience and uh, I'd been married when I got my when I got my wings in the Navy. I got married. Dorothy Joe, my wife, was at home, and she heard that first radio show, that first audience participation show. And when I got home, she said, "That's what you should do." She said, "You did that better than you've ever done anything else." She didn't say I was good. She said I did it better than I'd ever done anything else. And here I am, still coming through these doors, all these years later. Game shows today, if you look at the right ones, are fine. <laughs> Jeopardy, I think Jeopardy's as good a show of that type as we've ever had. And Wheel of Fortune, another fine game show. Uh, my favorite happens to be Price is Right. <laughs> but, uh, some of the shows that they describe as game shows now uh, are not my idea of a game show. And I, I, they're, they're very successful, and they have a lot of viewers. So I guess they, they're reaching the audience. But uh, if that's all there had been when I started out, I'm sure I would not have been interested in doing what I'm doing. Now, one thing that I would tell hosts, young hosts, listen. So many of them, they are so concerned, they, they think they must have conversation. There must be something uh, going every moment in the way of conversation. And as they'll ask a question, and while the contestant is answering, they're not listening to the contestant. They're thinking about what well, I'm going to say next, or I'm going to do this joke, or what. If you just listen, they have those little gems out there to run with. And that would be the one bit of advice I would give a young host. My experience with Rod was very similar to my, re my experience with Johnny. Uh, we auditioned some of the top announcers in, uh, in uh, town when, uh, when Johnny died. And we, we chose Rod and uh, we never regretted the, the uh, uh, choice. And Rod had great respect for this show from the first day. He had great respect for the show, and he had great respect for Johnny. Uh, I'll tell you a story about Rod. My dressing room was right off stage here, and just across the hall was Johnny's dressing room, and it was a small dressing room, and Rod moved into that, and so a larger dressing room opened up, and I went to Rod, and I said, uh, Rod, you know, there's a larger dressing room over here. If you'd like to move, oh, no. He said, I want to stay right here. This was Johnny's dressing room. Now, is that a beautiful thought? Ralph Edwards 
was a very successful producer, the packager, but he was also a fine host. And he knew hosting, and he knew uh, what, how I felt coming out there on the stage to do a national show for the first time. And just before I went on, just a few hours before I went on, he came to me and he said, Bob, this is your show. He said, you are the star of, of Truth or Consequences now. And he said, I want you to go out there and do that show the way you want to do it. Don't try to imitate me, Ralph, or anyone else. He said, just be Bob Barker and it'll work. And I was Bob Barker, and here I am, still Bob Barker, still working. Our show is different every day. We have more than 70 games, and we rotate them. And uh, if you see the show Monday, you'll see a different show Tuesday, and a different show Wednesday, a different show Thursday, and a different show Friday. Some games are on every week. Some are on every other week. Some every three weeks or so. But uh, we keep you interested in that respect. And it's a fast-moving show. It, we, we don't waste any time here. We move it. And it, of course, we have tremendous prizes, huge prizes, great prizes. It, it's, uh, it's all of these elements together. Hosts come in all shapes and sizes. And it's just like pie. Some people like lemons, some like cherries, some like chocolate. And the same is true with hosts. But I think that the, the ones, uh, of course, there are different types of shows. If it's a show where you're, who are you, where are you from, what number do you want type show, why an actor or a comedian can just fit in there and do that, and it'd be a breeze. But if you're going to work with unrehearsed contestants out of an audience, then I think one of the essentials is experience. I don't care how much natural talent you have for it. Every show uh, helps you improve your work. Beyond that, some uh, have been very successful putting contestants down and, and making them the uh, object of the joke. I don't do that. I, I much prefer to have the joke be on me and, and have the contestant get the laugh. Uh, I try to treat contestants as if they were guests in my home. I want them to be glad that they were chosen to be on the show. I want them to enjoy every moment on this stage. And I want them to look back on it with fond memories of the whole experience. Right now, I'm concentrating on the overpopulation of animals. There are just too many dogs and cats being born. Today in the United States, there are 45 dogs and cats born for every human baby. And in the United States today, one out of 10 dogs born will have a home eventually. One out of 12 cats will have a home eventually. So we have to do something about that. And the obvious thing is to have your pet spayed or neutered. In 1994, I established the DJ and T Foundation. It's named in memory of my wife, Dorothy Jo, and my mother, whose name was Matilda, but everyone called her Tilly. And they both loved animals of all kinds, and I named it the DJ and T Foundation. And what we do is to fund grants for organizations all across the United States. And it's just so successful. I love it. I spend as much time on that as I do on Price is Right. <laughs> when I learned that I was to uh, be inducted into the Television Hall of Fame, uh, I felt I was humbled by, by virtue of the fact. But uh, beyond that, I was elated. I think every inductee is, uh, is probably equally elated. And in my own uh, case, I can honestly say that in the years to come, they may induct people who deserve it more than I, but they will never 
induct anyone who appreciates it more than I. The games on The Price is Right that I enjoy most are the ones in which I have an opportunity to interact with the contestant. Now, the most popular game on The Price is Right is Plinko. No, no doubt about that. And I love Plinko. I have a lot of fun with Plinko. But I don't get the interaction with the contestant that I do in a game like it's in the bag. Or uh, I love the golf game if I make my putt. If I miss my putt, I hate that game. But uh, another game I like is uh, Punch a Bunch, where we, I can tease them and have fun with them about what's really on that slip in the punch board, you know. Those are the kind of games that I enjoy most. My favorite moments uh, are the moments that I have with contestants. Uh, uh, one of them was today, a, a gentleman here with the Sons of Italy from San Jose named Salvatore. And he had on a, uh, the, the Italian colors on a great cap that could have been on some college student and a great jacket. And uh, he, he had the situation completely in control. He, he was not at all offensive, he wasn't obnoxious, not at all. But he, he just was, he was very relaxed. Television didn't bother him, but he just didn't pay any attention to what he was bidding on. And we'd had, we actually had to bring a, a prize back out on stage for him. And of course he won. And uh, came up and tripped on the steps coming up to me got himself up he said drinking again and, <laughs> and I don't know whether he was or not he could have been but the audience loved him and I loved him uh, I had a young lady out here in the audience in a tube top and uh, this is probably the most memorable single incident in Price is Right history her name was called to be a contestant she jumped to her feet she began jumping up and down and out they came. She came on down and they came on, on out on CBS. It's hard for me to comprehend that I am 80 years old. 80 years old, you know? When I was 50, I thought, well, this isn't old. I'm fine. And uh, then, I, but 60, that's pretty old. When I was 60, and I thought, well, I feel great, and, uh, you know, I'm having fun, and, but 70, that's old. And uh, then I was 70, and I thought, hey, man, let's, let's party. And uh, I thought, but 80, that's old. But uh, here I am at 80, let's go get a drink. <laughs> this is Bob Barker reminding you, help control the pet population, have your pets spayed or neutered. Now, before I say goodbye, let me thank the Game Show Network for this wonderful tribute. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.